Hey, what's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Chris. It's your boy, Chris. It's another amazing episode of Financial Patient. This channel is all about making money. It's all about saving money. It's all about building generational wealth. And it's all about financially emancipating yourself from generational poverty. On this channel, everybody, I give you a six-figure MBA level worth of investing and financial advice and knowledge for free here on YouTube. And the things that people typically spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn in grad school and business school and things like that, I give it to you for free here on this channel. <laughs> Before I get started, everybody, I want to give a shout out to one of my sponsors, uh, Killica Solutions. If you need digital marketing, uh, website development, or someone to essentially edit your YouTube videos, they are the best in the business at meeting your digital needs, okay? They're the ones who do all these dope graphics that you see. It's not me personally, it's, it's Killica Solutions, and I want to give a shout out to them because their work is absolutely phenomenal, okay? Uh, please hit that notification bell or whatever, and let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started, okay? Let's go ahead and get started. So today we're gonna to talk about living trust and I'm gonna talk about the Vanderbilt method. I'm gonna talk about the Rockefeller method, okay? And which one you should actually go with, all right? So uh, first of all, this will be, uh, I want you guys to grab a pen and a pad and everything because we're gonna run through a lot of different concepts in this particular video. And I wanna give you a historical record about uh, what happens when you build generational wealth the right way and what happens when you build generational wealth the wrong way. So uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt built his empire off of steamships and then ultimately the railroad industry. If you're familiar with uh, the way this country was built or whatever, uh, railroads are one of the founding uh, blocks essentially that kind of allowed America to essentially become the United States of America. Well, Vanderbilt essentially built his uh, literally hundreds of billions of dollars off of building a monopoly essentially in the uh, transportation slash the railroad industry. Uh, Rockefeller, uh, he basically was an oil guy. He essentially started an oil company called Standard Oil and eventually his oil company went from indoor kerosene lighting to oil for gasoline and for cars. Uh, think of it like this, at one point, 90% of all gas stations in America were owned by Rockefeller. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> uh, Standard Oil, Rockefeller's company, ultimately ended up becoming Exxon Mobil and Chevron, and ultimately he uh, ended up uh, becoming starting uh, what became known as Chase Bank years down the road or whatever. So Vanderbilt pivoted essentially from steamships to railroads, and Rockefeller pivoted from the oil kerosene lighting industry to gasoline for automobiles. Before Rockefeller died, this man gave away nearly $600 million in the 1920s. Think about that for a minute. That's how wealthy this dude was. Uh, there's a reason why Jay-Z basically called his, uh, his uh, record label Rockefeller Records. <laughs> In any event, uh, the Vanderbilts went from rags to riches and then essentially from riches to rags. And what's interesting, it's actually a cautionary tale in regards to how if you don't set your children up the right way, you don't teach them basically how to invest the money that you leave them. It does not matter how much money you make or whatever. Eventually, it's all going to be gone. And at his death in 1870, Cornelius Vanderbilt was worth over 200 billion with a B dollars. Now, Vanderbilt uh, had 13 kids, 10 daughters, and three sons. And uh, Vanderbilt, actually, interestingly enough, Cornelius Vanderbilt believed that women should not be in business. He therefore refused to teach his daughters anything. He essentially uh, spoiled them, but he never actually raised them, if you want to call it that. And he's also on record saying that he thought two of his three sons were dumb. So as a result, he only taught one of his 13 uh, kids, one of his sons, essentially, how to run his empire and how to run his monopoly. Um, due to a combination of family infighting, alcoholism, lavish parties, drug addictions, broken families, affairs, and things like that, the uh, Vanderbilt empire crumbled and their family fortune disappeared basically uh, over a series of decades. I'll give you an example. 150 years after his death, the Vanderbilt uh, 200 empire, $200 billion empire was literally gone. Uh, modern day uh, Vanderbilts, if you ever watch CNN, Anderson Cooper, he actually is uh, the great, great, great grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. And when his mother died in uh, 2019, he inherited her her uh, apartment, her house, and I'm sorry, in New York City. He, on he only got $1.5 million. So $1.5 million is a lot of money, but compared to the $200 billion that his great, great, great grandfather Cornelius Vanderbilt had, People, that's not even pennies on the dollar. And to me, that is a testament to what happens when you basically do not raise your children the right way. It does not matter how much money you have. If you don't teach your kids how to run the businesses that you start or essentially how to manage the money that you leave them, eventually it's literally all proverbially going to go up in smoke. So that's the Vanderbilts. Now let's, let's take a look at the Rockefellers, okay? Before he died in 1937, Rockefeller gave away, literally, as I said earlier, over $600 million. That's crazy. In modern times, the Rockefeller family is worth around $9 billion today, and their wealth is essentially spread over 70 heirs. 
So while Anderson Cooper and the Vanderbilts essentially um, inherited $1.5 million in 2019, in 2019, the Rockefellers had a net worth of over $8 billion. And today in 2023 or whatever, the Rockefellers have a net worth of over $9 billion. And that's not including uh, the, the holdings they have in their base in, in their banks, Chase Bank. So what happened? How do two guys go from essentially owning over two to three hundred billion dollars or whatever around the same time period? And then 150, 120 years later, one family has a net worth of rough, one family is giving essentially one point five million dollars to the last heir and the other family is giving over nine billion dollars to the last heir. How did that happen? The answer is simple. Living trusts. So. To everybody listening, I want you guys to research the Rockefeller Trust from 1934, okay? And more importantly, read as elitist people, I want you to read the book, What Would the Rockefellers Do? It's a phenomenal book. Rockefeller created a series of irrevocable trusts that helped pass wealth from one generation to the next generation and also prevented the family fortune from being ruined by one of his irresponsible family members who had who, who uh, basically had multiple flings, who would have had uh, drug problems, who basically would have just been an idiot with money. The Rockefeller method of the state planning has essentially succeeded in creating generational wealth for over six consecutive generations. Once again, I want you guys to read, read the book, What Would the Rockefellers Do? Because when I study both men, it shows us that multi-generational wealth planning is literally just as important or more important, if you want to look at it that way, as planning for our own wealth. And the typical American today has less than $4,000 saved in the bank. Our responsible American has a paid off home and over $250,000 in one of their retirement accounts when they reach retirement. But very, very, very few Americans will have living trust in place or estate plan in place that prepares a way for their kids and their grandkids to reap multi-generational wealth. Transferring wealth in America is highly taxed, and there are several strategies that way to protect your family from certain taxes, such as the estate tax, uh, gift tax, inheritance tax, and things of that nature that I won't go into for this video. So with that, I keep talking about the Rockefeller method. What is the Rockefeller method as far as, as living trust and estate planning? Well, here we go. Rockefeller would give a certain portion of his wealth to his children when they turned a certain age, okay? And with that certain portion, he would only give them to him if they basically met certain stipulations. And then from there, he would give a certain percentage of that wealth to his grandkids. And he would just allow it to compound and compound and compound. And then he would do the same thing for his grandkids, rinse and repeat. So Rockefeller would essentially take money and put it into account. And he would only give a certain percentage to his children and his grandchildren from that account. He would then have his children create trust had the money compound over decades. And Rockefeller would then give this money to his children, his grandchildren when they turned a certain age. So I'm a numbers guy. So let's do some examples, okay? Because I once again, I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm a numbers dude. So for example, let's say the day that your son is born, you put $50,000 into his living trust that compounds at 10% over a 15 year period that also rolls into a brokerage account. 25 years later, this account is now worth $600,000. Now, the day your son has a son, the day your grandson is born, you tell your son to start a living trust for your grandson. And when your son starts a living trust for uh, for his son, for your grandson or whatever, you reward your son by giving him $300,000, essentially half of that $600,000 that was in his account. You then take the other $300,000, you start a living trust that also becomes a broker, that rolls into a brokerage account, and you put $300,000 into your grandson's living trust. So now your grandson has two accounts. He's got the living trust that his father started, your son, and he's got the living trust that you started, his grandfather, or whatever. Now, 25 years later, your grandson or whatever, that $300,000 living trust that you started <laughs> is now worth $4 million. And on top of that, he has the living trust that you started, and he has a living trust that, your, that his father started, your son. You then tell your grandson, when he has a good son or whatever, your great-grandson, you tell your, you tell your uh, grandson or whatever, okay, I will give you $2 million if you start a living trust or whatever for your son, for my great-grandson or whatever. Then the day your great-grandson is born, you essentially uh, open another living trust or whatever, and you put $2 million into that account, and you give your, your grandson the other $2 million. By the time your great-grandson is born, he will have $24 million in his living trust that you started for him 25 years earlier. And best of all, your great-grandson is getting the money, he's getting the uh, living trust that his great-grandfather started, he's getting uh, money from the living trust that his gra uh, grandfather started, and he's also getting the money uh, from uh, the trust that his father, your grandson, started. Essentially, people, you just rinse and repeat the process generation after generation. And voila, you have literally changed your family's generational wealth and given them the gift of compound interest.
This is the Rockefeller method. This is the compound interest over 25 year increment method. And it works like magic. Trust, however, can only go to the last living relative of yours. So if you die um, and your last living heir is your great grandchild, that means your great great grandchild is gonna essentially have to start the process or whatever. But um, the thing about it is this people, uh, just listen to the method or whatever that Rockefeller used. And essentially he has generations and heirs that are literally getting 11 to 12 different trusts being paid out to them from various family members. And that people is the reason why I say a financial patient, we have got to get serious about our financial literacy, okay? Because when you take a look at what these kind of things are, uh, this type of information is literally available or whatever. We can do this people. And as a result, you need to start basically getting serious about your uh, finances or whatever and buckle down this kind of stuff, all right? So before I go any further, I want you to hit that notification bell so that uh, you know when I drop new content. Please hit that like button. Please share the video, comment, and subscribe. It helps the algorithm. And I thoroughly enjoy giving you guys free uh, knowledge or whatever, free content on this channel, all right? So let's keep let's go, go a little deeper into trust. I'm actually going to film a separate video about this. But uh, trust, revocable versus irrevocable trust. The cool thing about trust is that you can literally stipulate exactly what you want your beneficiaries to do uh, before they actually uh, get that money. So for instance, you can stipulate whether or not you want that person to have a master's degree, whether you want them to be a master electrician, you can stipulate whether or not you want them to be 25 or whatever, 22, you can stipulate essentially what stipulations and what criteria they need to meet essentially to uh, get that money. For instance, Shaquille O'Neal, his daughters and his sons have got to get a master's degree in order to get any of his money. That's one stipulation. I know people, the kids have to turn 35 or whatever, and have to have a 10 year track record essentially of employment. That's a stipulation. So with trust, you can literally stipulate what they need to do to qualify for your money. And best of all, if you basically uh, use the laws of compound interest, that money just, just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it rolls over. So my advice is to start with a revocable trust or whatever, because you want to be able to change it. Uh, literally, if you see the person you're supposed to get, it does not deserve it. And that way you have a large saying what that child gets and what, it, and what it can, it's going to convert into or whatever. And secondly, I would say um, when you're about to die or whatever, then change that trust into, a, uh, into an irrevocable trust or whatever, because that way you have a direct say as far as who gets who and what. And by that point, they should have proven to you that they're actually worthy of, the, of uh, getting that money. So go to an estate planner and they can set up essentially and tell you uh, how to go from there. And my advice is to speak to a professional who's already set up trust or has a network of people of doing this for people, okay? That's my advice. So uh, in conclusion, everybody, uh, Living trusts are one of the reasons, as I said earlier, that I started Financipation. Because once again, they do not talk about living trust, 401ks, custodial accounts, or the Rockefeller method in the barbershops or in the hood. They do not talk about this stuff or whatever on the basketball courts, the block parties, or in the churches or whatever. They don't talk about this stuff at the pool parties. They don't talk about this stuff in the parts of America that look like me. And as a result, I am sick and tired of my people and our people working hard our entire lives and having literally nothing to show for it because they don't talk about this kind of stuff and we have no financial literacy. And I'm sick and tired of our people not building any generational wealth or because we don't understand how building generational wealth actually works. Now, the Bible says that a wise man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren and to his great grandchildren. And if religion really is not your thing or whatever, cool. Look no further than the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers. Both men literally made close to $300 billion of money in their lives. But six generations later, one family has a few million dollars in the bank, whereas the other family has close to $10 billion in the bank. In America, people, all you need is one person to take your family from rags to riches. And with a living trust and proper estate planning, your family can literally become the Rockefellers and not end up like the Vanderbilts. So this channel, everybody, is all about making money. It's all about saving money. It's all about building generational wealth. And it's all about financially emancipating yourself from generational poverty, okay? You can book a session with me at um, any point. The link is below. Please follow me on Instagram at the real underscore financipation. My Facebook page is financipation. And I check us on my digital, my e-products below as well. Also, I have a financial blog that's going to be coming out soon. And uh, please hit that notification bell, all right? Take it easy, everybody. It's your boy, Chris. I'm out. Peace. Peace. <music>